Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of The Authority, uh, where we are going to be discussing arguably the greatest writer who ever lived. If we would look at the history of Western civilization, there are really only three uh, writers, I would suggest, who can claim the crown as the greatest. And we could argue forever, perhaps, about which of these three deserve the laurel. But uh, the three would be the triumvirate, if you like, that straddle the centuries above all others, head and shoulders above the rest, so to speak, are Homer, uh, the great uh, writer from the classical Greek period, who was actually the, the subject of our first episode in the authority, uh, Dante, the great medieval poet uh, with his masterpiece, arguably the greatest work of literature ever written, The Divine Comedy. And finally, the subject of today's episode, the great William Shakespeare. So uh, William Shakespeare is an uh, almost exact contemporary with the subject of la the last episode, St. Robert Southall. Um, they both uh, were born within a, a year, St. Robert Southall's a year or two older. Um, Shakespeare was born in 1564, so six years into the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, and died in 1616 during the reign of the monarch who succeeded uh, Elizabeth I, uh, James VI of Scotland, who became James I of England. So we cannot understand William Shakespeare's work unless we understand who William Shakespeare is. To remind ourselves, the uh, modus operandi of, or, of, of this, uh, this podcast series and the philosophy which, which informs it is that the most authoritative voice in understanding a work of literature is the authorial authority. Uh, that's why this is called the authority, because we respect the authority of the author. So obviously, the more we know about Shakespeare, the more we will be able to understand his work. So let's look at, look at Shakespeare. And what we will see, he's almost, he, he was almost certainly uh, a believing and probably a practicing Catholic, albeit, of course, secretly, because the Catholic faith was illegal. Uh, during the whole of the time that Shakespeare was alive, with uh, one brief period of, of liberty following the, the, the uh, accession to the throne of James I in 1603 and 1604. We'll come to that in due course. Um, so there are two ways of, uh, of understanding Shakespeare's Catholicism. One is to look at the facts of his life and times, so what the biographical and historical evidence for his Catholicism. And the other is the textual evidence, the evidence to be found in his poetry and plays. So what I would like to do is to spend the first part of this episode looking at the historical uh, and biographical evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism, and then the second part are looking at some of the textual evidence. We'll only scratch the surface uh, in, in, the, in the latter part because, uh, I mean, books and books could and should be written on that topic. So as I said, Shakespeare was born in 1564, in the, early in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, um, and this was a, a time when it was I the illegal to be a Catholic in England, uh, and uh, certainly from 1580 onwards, uh, would be punished by death uh, to be a Catholic priest in England and punished by death to shelter and harbour a Catholic priest in England. Uh, we should say that unlike, we, the other thing we have to take a step back, so the historical context, is that the Reformation in England is very different from the Reformation on the continent. In fact, the 16th century uh, is basically uh, informed by, animated by three separate reformations and uh, all of which is very different so we, we have the protestant reformation uh, on the continent where martin luther and john calvin and others had very real theological differences with the uh, teaching of the catholic church and so that reformation was was rooted in theological and philosophical differences um uh, even though many, many worldly princes used that 
division in Europe for their own worldly secular ambitions, uh, with the outbreak of war being the consequence, etc. But nonetheless, there was a, a real theological uh, and philosophical difference between the Protestants and uh, the Catholics. In England, however, Henry VIII um, broke with Rome, not because he was against the Catholic Church. On the contrary, he had authored, possibly with the help of two men who would later have killed uh, St. Rob, St. St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher, he wrote a, a, a refutation of the teaching of Luther, which was entitled In Defense of the Seven Sacraments, where he defended the seven sacraments of the church, which were under attack and under fire. Uh, by Martin Luther's teaching. For this, ironically, considering his later actions, he was awarded the title Fidei Defensor, Defender of the Faith, by the Pope. Um, this was rescinded when uh, Henry VIII broke with Rome. But why did Henry VIII break with Rome? Because um, uh, he wanted um, a divorce from his wife, um, the very, very good Catherine of Aragon, who I'm always tempted to canonize, not, not that I have any right to do so. Um, certainly she's buried in Peter, Peterborough Cathedral, and I've often, when I've been going through Peterborough in England, uh, I have I've prayed uh, above her tomb. Uh, she's buried under the, uh, under the, uh, the, the nave. Um, so because he, she, she appealed to Rome, because she didn't want a divorce, there were no grounds for a divorce, Henry basically just breaks with Rome, declares himself head of the church. He effectively establishes a state religion of which he is himself the dictator um, and all the bishops are become under his tyrannical authority. So what we have is the, the establishment of a, of a state religion um, against the will of the people. This is absolutely important, very different. You know, Luther had a following in, 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 in Germany and in Switzerland and uh, in France and Calvin had a following in Switzerland and France. Um, the the Henry had no, very little following amongst the people of England who were very very much uh, uh, Catholic in in belief and in practice. The only reason he got away with uh, his attempt to make himself head of the church was by buying off the aristocracy by offering them the church land. So he confiscated and closed down all the monasteries and convents around around England that were themselves uh, the, the schools, uh, the hospitals, the places where the poor uh, could, could seek relief, uh, the places where people could stay um, on, uh, during their travels. These were closed down uh, and the, the monasteries were dissolved and the land given to whichever members of the nobility of the aristocracy that would, would, would join Henry in his pillage of the church and it's by this the enrichment of the few that the state religion was imposed upon the people of england so as the majority of the people in england were were um catholic by sensibility they fell into three camps um the church conformists who outwardly paid lip service to the state religion because you were fined if you did not attend anglican services a certain number of times uh, a year so outwardly they conformed uh but moaned uh under their breath and hope for the return of the good old days. They were then where the second group were, were a group that were called the church papists by their enemies. And these were, were, were people who lived a double life. Outwardly, they conformed to the state religion, but secretly they continued to practice their Catholic faith whenever there was a Catholic priest available. Of course, the priests were now underground because the, the church was illegal. Uh, and then the third group were the recusants, to th those who refused to attend the state services and paid the fines or were forced into exile or were sent to prison or were executed for their refusal to conform to the state religion. Shakespeare's family were recusants. His mother's family, the Ardens, were, were from one of the most um, uh, defiant, uh, recusant families, one of the most devout Catholic families. Uh, some of Shakespeare's cousins were executed for their part in uh, in I illegal Catholic activities. Um, Shakespeare's father was fined for his recusancy in 1592, by which time Shakespeare is writing his plays. Um, earlier than that, he resigns from his role in politics uh, in Stratford-upon-Avon when it becomes necessary for politicians, local government officials to... 
uh, take an oath of supremacy whereby they would accept the king as the supreme head of the church. John Shakespeare evidently in conscience did not feel able to do that, so he resigned from any active role in politics rather than to compromise his conscience. Shakespeare himself had to leave Stratford-upon-Avon in a hurry um, due to uh, his offending the local lord of the manor. We don't know exactly what he did to offend him. Uh, some say he wrote a sonnet attacking him. Others say he was he poached in the, in the land uh, on the Lord of the Manor's lands. We, the fact is, we don't know. What we do know is the Lord of the Manor was very, very anti-Catholic. Who took a, took a great joy and satisfaction in overseeing the raids on Catholic homes in Stratford upon Avon um, amongst the recusant families, possibly Shakespeare's own family. Certainly, we know of raids on houses of Shakespeare's friends. So he leaves in a hurry. Eventually he arrives in London, um, and um, the, the evidence such as it is in London uh, of his life also suggests he remained a, uh, um, a defiant Catholic. The Earl of Southampton, his patron, uh, was a recusant Catholic who had the Jesuit martyr Sir Robert Southall as his personal confessor. Um, Shakespeare clearly moved in recusant circles. His poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle, seems to allude to another uh, um, recusant couple, Roger and Anne Lyne. Anne Lyne would be martyred for harbouring Catholic priests um, in 1600, around the time Shakespeare writes his very angry play, Hamlet. Um, but perhaps the best evidence for Shakespeare's recusancy in, 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 in the early times, in, in, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, is when he is... Um, Actually, he ends up being charged with threatening uh, the lives of two people. Um, uh, and he's bound over to keep the peace. What's interesting is the, the people who Shakespeare clearly had as enemies were known priest hunters who gloated about their um, raids on, on Catholic homes, about bringing out crucifixes and Catholic books and Catholic pictures and burning them outside the houses in a bonfire. Um, so these are Shakespeare's enemies. His co-defendants, because there were people also charged with him, were no, included known recusant Catholics. So Shakespeare's friends are recusant Catholics. His enemies are those who persecute the Catholics. But the best evidence biographically for Shakespeare's Catholicism comes from the last thing that he did um, before leaving London uh, to retire and return to his family in Stratford-upon-Avon. This was the purchasing of the Blackfriars Gatehouse in about 1611 or 1612. Um, so what's the Blackfriars Gatehouse? Well, as its name would suggest, it was the gatehouse to Blackfriars. Blackfriars were the Dominicans. So it was the entrance house to the Blackfriars um, religious community in London. And if you go to London, the area where that uh, Dominican uh, religious house was, it's still called Blackfriars. There's a Blackfriars Bridge, there's a Blackfriars Tube Station, there's a Blackfriars area of London. So Shakespeare buys a Blackfriars gatehouse. Now this is 80 years after the dissolution, almost 80, 75 years after the dissolution of the monasteries. So the, it certainly doesn't, hasn't belonged to the Dominicans for, for, for decades. But we know from the property deeds that this house remained in resolute Catholic hands from the time of the dissolution of the monastery 75 years earlier to the time that Shakespeare buys it. We also know that the home is used as a base for secret Catholic activities. The house is raided on several occasions and there are secret passageways leading down to the River Thames. Um, the house is on the Thames by which priests that are hiding there can escape. Um, by the secret passage and then onto a boat, etc. We know of, 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 of Jesuit priests on the run from the authorities who seek refuge there. So this was a, a centre for Catholic activity. This is the house that Shakespeare purchases. Certainly didn't purchase it to live in, because as we've said, uh, he uh, purchased it just before leaving London. Uh, and nor did he purchase it merely as an investment because he was a wealthy he'd been a wealthy man for a long while he bought the second largest house in stratford upon avon for his own family um uh 12 or so years earlier uh, so he could certainly could afford to buy houses earlier but he had lived at this time this time in london for 25 years without ever purchasing a property to live in there might be various reasons for that which we don't have time to discuss 
but um, uh, he clearly purchased it so it could continue to be used in the same manner it had been used. And this is clear from the fact that he stipulates upon purchasing it that the current tenant should remain. And that tenant's name is John Robinson. John Robinson is clearly a friend of Shakespeare's. He's the only one of Shakespeare's London friends who are, who's present during Shakespeare's final illness and signs his will. In the very year in which Shakespeare purchased the Blackfriars Gatehouse, John Robinson's brother enters the English College in Rome to study for the priesthood. So uh, the final evidence is the fact that perhaps that the executress of Shakespeare's will is his daughter Susanna, who had herself been fined for her Catholic recusancy in 1606. Um, and many of the beneficiaries of Shakespeare's will are local Catholics. So that's the, at least some of the biographical and historical evidence. If you want to dig and delve deeper, I invite you to read my book, The Quest for Shakespeare, The Bard of Avon and the Church of Rome, which gives the biographical and textual evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism. We'll now move on for the uh, second part of this podcast to look at um, uh, the textual evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism. Uh, and I look at this in two other books that I've written, Through Shakespeare's Eyes, Discovering the, uh, the Catholic Presence in the Plays, which looks at the Catholic presence in three of Shakespeare's plays, uh, The Merchant of Venice, Hamlet, and uh, King Lear. And then I wrote another book called Shakespeare and Love, uh, Discovering the Catholic Presence in Romeo and Juliet, um, the, which has the appendix, uh, or has an appendix on the Jesuit connection. So in the few minutes we have, I'm just going to scratch the surface, so to speak, and look at some of the evidence from some of the plays. Um, let's look at The Merchant of Venice first. So the, the Merchant of Venice basically is set on two levels. Uh, there's the worldly level uh, of Venice itself, where the people are, are, are worldly and secular and sinful and avaricious and prideful and vengeful. And then there's Belmont, uh, as the name suggests, the beautiful mountain where the heavenly Portia lives. This is sort of this uh, mysterious realm that seems to be above and beyond the, the wickedness of the world. And we're clearly reminded in the structure of the play morally between the high ground of Belmont and the low ground of Venice between Augustine's city of God uh, and his city of man. And basically the, the, the story tells the difference between the two. And there are three tests uh, in The Merchant of Venice, uh, the, the testing of the caskets, where in order to gain uh, the hand of the heavenly Portia and 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 become um, heir to to the beauty of Belmont, this heavenly sphere of the city of God. One must choose the leaden casket above the gold and silver caskets. One must choose the wealth of heaven uh, and the health of holiness over worldly wealth and wickedness. And this the the uh, Bassanio does. He chooses to lay down his life for his friends. Uh, the, the the true Christian definition of love: to die to ourselves, to choose the death of self for the good of the beloved. And in making that choice, he wins the hand of the of the, of, uh, the heavenly Portia uh, in marriage. Um, so. There are allusions in that, as we discussed in the previous episode, to the poems of St. Robert Southall. I should say another thing about that, that, that play is, although ostensibly uh, the villain of the piece Shylock is, is Jewish, uh, we have to understand that Shakespeare is, is, is being forced to use euphemisms. It was illegal in Elizabethan England at the time that Shakespeare was writing to talk about contemporary religion and politics on the stage. Um, so he couldn't talk about what was happening uh, uh, in terms of religion and politics because it was illegal to do so. So he had to talk about contemporary religion and politics euphemistically through the use of euphemism and allegory. So he sets his plays in the past, um, uh, but n knowing that the people will see parallels between the past and the present. So Queen Elizabeth was actually said that, do you not know that I am Richard II, referring to um, 
Shakespeare's play of that title. Richard III is a Machiavellian ruler. Many people were seeing connections between um, Shakespeare's history plays and contemporary England, so much so that the, that there was the so-called Bishop's Ban was passed in the late 1590s, making it illegal to write uh, plays based upon English history. Um, because it, they, they, quite clearly these were being used euphemistically uh, to talk about contemporary England. So Shakespeare then writes plays about other countries. He writes Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, Macbeth about a Scottish king, uh, obviously plays set in, in ancient Rome, such as Antony and Cleopatra. So he gets round, ra around it that way. But he also gets around it in The Merchant of Venice because um, the... There, there, there had been virtually no Jews in England for 300 years because they had been expelled by Edward I 300 years earlier. The only money lenders in England were the Calvinists, were the Puritans. And this was because the Catholic Church had always condemned usury, um, money lending, uh, whereas uh, Calvin had permitted the practice of usury to, uh, to, to his own followers. So in England, the only money lenders were the Puritans. And we have to understand, uh, that for Shakespeare's audience, that the full star, that, that the characters such as as uh, characters such as uh, Shylock in *The Merchant of Venice* or Falstaff in uh, *Henry the Fourth, Part One*, *Henry the Fourth, Part Two*, and *Henry the Fifth, and in the play *Merry Lives of Windsor*, *Merry Wives of Windsor*, and the character of Malvolio, who's actually called a Puritan in the play *Twelfth Night*. Are, are Shakespeare's attacks upon Puritanism. Now, you have to understand something about this as well, that the Puritans are not just anti-Catholic, um, very insistent upon the continuing persecution of England's Catholics. They were also against the, the theatre. And when the Puritans eventually gained enough power uh, following the English Civil War, they not only, of course, brought back uh, intensified persecution of Catholicism, they also closed down all the theatres. And indeed, during the period of Puritan rule following the English Civil War, they even for a while banned Christmas as being a papist uh, festival. It is, it is, after all, means Christ Mass. So... Shakespeare knew the dangers of Puritanism, and so would his audience. Of course, you know, his audience are, are people who go to plays, who go to the theatre. Uh, the very thing that, that, that the Puritans have, have, have um, uh, dismissed as being uh, satanic. There are quotes, um, when, we, when we do the, the, uh, the episode on Richard Crashaw, we'll look at Richard Crashaw's puritanical father and what he had to say about the theatre. So really, we have to see, uh, ironically, uh, considering that, that Shylock is a Jew and, and what's happened, uh, our, our, our sense of quite correct sensibility towards anti-Semitism following the outrages of Adolf Hitler, for instance, uh, that for Shakespeare's audience, he would have been seen not as a Jew because there were very few Jews in England, but as a, a thinly veiled Puritan money changer. And uh, this is like, actually, I said, ironically, like the Nazis, the, 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 the Puritans were, were despised by Shakespeare's audience as those who basically sought to destroy what Shakespeare's audience believed in and, and what they wanted. So look at some other plays. We've looked at uh, a, a Hamlet. The something rotten in the state of Denmark is something rotten in the state of England. The play was written at around the time of the Essex Rebellion. It's a very angry play. Um, one of the Earl of Essex's right-hand men in that rebellion was the Earl of Southampton, Shakespeare's um, uh, patron. And whereas the Earl of Essex was executed when the, when the uh, rebellion was overthrown, the Earl of Southampton was spared but thrown into... Uh, the Tower of London and was only released following the death of the Queen um, three years later. So Shakespeare was clearly involved in this and the anger which led to that rebellion is present in the play. Um, and it's a play which is very much about spies. And we have to understand that the that, that people who Shakespeare almost certainly knew, such as Anne Lyne, uh, the, the 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 martyr and St. Robert Southall were betrayed by Elizabeth's and then James's spy network. Um, the spy network, people pretended to be converts to the faith, or else Catholics were bribed and blackmailed. Um, the usual the usual dirty, sordid work of espionage. So 
Hamlet's very much a play that uh, that's, uh, vents his anger, where Shakespeare vents his spleen against spies. So Rosencrantz Rosencrat and Guildenstern, who are uh, former school friends of Hamlet, who are now in the service of the wicked King Claudius, who killed Hamlet's father, so having an adulterous relationship with his mother. Um, uh, Polonius, the relativist... Uh, in, in, in philosophy, who uh, believes there's no truth but the, but but your own, no objective truth, only subjective truth. He's the spy master who leads this spe- network of spies. He would have reminded Shakespeare's audience of the wicked Lord Burley, who oversaw Elizabeth's spy network. Um, Hamlet's anger against Ophelia, the woman he loves, when he realizes that she is spying on him, that uh, that she's. Uh, to make matters worse, pretending to be praying, so pretending to be pious, when actual fact she's serving her father in spying upon the man she loves. Her father and King Claudius are hiding uh, while she pretends uh, to to be um, loyal and loving towards Hamlet. This is a play that's very angry. And then we look at let's look at King's, King Lear, the play King Lear, in that play, we see a theme which is a recurrent theme in the poetry of, of St. Robert Southall, that we have to choose poverty. We have to lay down our lives for, uh, for Christ and his church, for God and neighbor. Um, we have to choose death. We have to choose to die to ourselves. So in King Lear, the play begins with King Lear doing exactly what the kings of England have done. Um, to demand absolute allegiance to the state above all else. King Lear tells his daughters that if they um, swear absolute devotion to him and tell him how much they love him, he will reward them with land, just as Henry VIII did with the aristocrats who uh, uh, who um, gave absolute loyalty to him when he dissolved the monasteries, he gave them the land. Um so the two daughters who don't love King Lear pretend that they do and feign their love for him. And the daughter who does truly love the king, um, Cordelia, whose very name Cordelia could mean uh, Lear's heart, or Cordelion, lion heart, more to the point with Cordelia, she refuses to lie. And she says to him, she can only offer him the love which is due to him as her father and as her king. She cannot offer that love which is due, for instance, to her bridegroom when she should get married. And as in many of Shakespeare's plays, references to brides and bridegrooms is also an, an elusive reference to Christ, who described himself as the bridegroom on many occasions, of course, uh, and the church as the bride of Christ. That, uh, that Cordelia cannot give to the king that which belongs to Christ or to her rightful husband, the heavenly bridegroom Christ himself, or her own bridegroom in marriage. So she refuses. She becomes a recusant. And like many recusants in, in England, she is exiled. And then in the play, we see the necessity of holy poverty. There are two types of wisdom in epitomized by the fools in the play there are two fools there's the worldly fool who tells the king he was foolish to give away his worldly power and then there's the heavenly fool who is introduced to us through the singing of a franciscan ballad who has embraced lady poverty who lives in rags who lives uh sleeping rough on the heath who uh tells us, confesses his sins and reiterates the Ten Commandments, um, who talks about the, the sins of pride and the sins of lust and the sins of avarice. And King Lear sees the wisdom of this foolishness and strips himself naked on the heath, saying, off, off, you lendings, that everything given to us in life is lent, that our lives and themselves are lent. We don't own our lives because we will be forced to relinquish them in God's good time. And um, so in doing this, of course, uh, King Lear is emulating the the uh, the actions of St. Francis of Assisi, so that, thus the, the, the reference to this, the Franciscan ballad, the Franciscan theme here. We have to lay down our very lives and all our belongings, embrace Lady Poverty uh, in order to embrace the poverty of Christ upon the cross. This wisdom 
is the wisdom of the holy fool and it's this wisdom which exercises the worldly wisdom of the of the earlier fool who disappears without trace as if he's exorcised by the coming of this holiness we could of course say much much more about the uh about the the uh, the catholic dimension in shakespeare's plays we don't have time uh to do so here i do invite you to to uh to read um uh, my books on the topic to go deeper into the Catholicism of this greatest of writers, William Shakespeare. Thanks, as always, for joining me. And until next time, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.